Hello, Simmons. I'm Richard Jr. here, and, and I play on the men's basketball team here at San Jose State. I major in kinesiology. I currently serve on several prestigious groups here on campus, such as, such as the Student Athletic Advisory Committee, otherwise known as SAC. On the executive board, I am the community outreach chair, also serving on the Mountain West Conference SAC committee board. I'm committed to changing the stigma of student athletes strictly being athletes. With my platform, I aim to uplift the community here for a better place to be. And I'm an intern with the Institute for the Study of Sport, Society, and Social Change. The purpose of the keynote conversation number two is to discuss the state of sport in society. Professionals, leaders of sport and sport organizations will share their perspective on the aspects that influence their management decisions during the onset of COVID-19 to and through the Black Lives Matter movement. Dr. Algerian Hart, Associate Dean of the Graduate College Professor of Kinesiology, Missouri State University President from 2020 to 2021, North American Society of the Sociology of Sport. Dr. Kevin Hilton, Emeritus, Professor of Equality and Diversity in Sport, Leisure and Education, Leeds Beckett University, UK, and Chair, Sheffield Race Equality, Race Equality Commission in the UK. Dr. Nicole Lavoy, Director, Tucker Center for Research on Girls and Women, University of Minnesota. Rochelle Patel, Director of Marketing and Events, Laura Sport for Good USA. The moderator for our esteemed panel is the amazing Dr. Sean Fletcher, Assistant Professor public relations and sport communications here at San Jose State. We invite you to learn more about our panelists, their efforts and works in your virtual conference program. Thank you and enjoy it. Caleb, thank you so much and, and well done to you, uh, and just as a, a kudos, you didn't mention it in your introduction, but I, I must call out the, the work that you and many of your student athlete peers are doing uh, on our campus and off of our campus, quite honestly, to move many of the issues that we're gonna talk about today and that we talked about yesterday forward. So kudos to you. And of course you have all of our support. As Caleb mentioned, I'm Dr. Sean Fletcher. I'm an assistant professor of public relations and sport communication here at San Jose State University. I am going to moderate, I am going to point guard, if you will, this, this panel. Uh, of esteemed colleagues of mine, uh, whom Caleb just introduced for about the next hour. So what I want you to, to think about as we're having this conversation, as we're leading into it, I want you to think about what stands out to you, what questions come to you. And as they come to you, I want you to, to put them in the Q&A box so we can curate them, so we can be prepared, so our panelists can be ready to engage you, all right? So we don't want you to necessarily wait until the end where you may forget some things. Um, drop them in the Q&A box as, as we're talking, okay? So with that being said, um, welcome, pan panelists. You can feel free to unmute yourself. We're just, we're just, we're talking amongst colleagues and peers, Good so morning. we don't have to go through the, the pomp and circumstance of staying muted. Come on, come on on Hi, camera. Sean. How are you doing? I'm doing well, doing well, all the way in the UK. Dr. Good Hilton, morning. Dr. Hart, yeah. Dr. Lavoy, Rochelle, how are you? Good, how are you? I am doing well. I'm, I'm excited, and, and we're actually running a little bit ahead of time, so we may have a little more time to, to wax poetic about some of these uh issues that we're gonna talk about. So let me, let me now that I have the, the housekeeping items out of the way, let, let's dive, let's dive into it. And normally what I would do, I would give this, this, this long contextual sort of lead in to the questions, but does this, this 2020 really need an introduction? Does 2020 really need more elaboration? I don't think so. Um, when you say 2020, I think a lot of things come to mind globally. That, that's, that's how we really know the impact of it. Uh, of course, as I, as I mentioned, Dr. Hilton is, is in the UK. The rest of us are, are stateside. And many of the, the same issues that we dealt with here in the States, not just COVID, of course, that's a global issue. 
but many of the issues related to, to racial inequity, gender inequity, some of the other social identity inequities and ills that we see in society, they span the, the globe. So with that being said, I will not give a long drawn out uh, lead into 2020, but I, I do want, and, and starting with Dr. Harp, I'll start with you, Dr. Harp, but I wanna hear from everyone. Let's talk about COVID. Let's talk about the impact of COVID. When COVID hit in earnest around March, mid-March, when we started to shut down globally, it impacted all of us. But talk about what impact has COVID had on you, your respective organizations work, and, and to not admire the problem, if you will, as I like to say, how have you managed to push through and continue moving your work forward? Dr. Hart, starting with you. Yeah, um, let me start with the amazing Dr. Fletcher. That's how I, I was that too. So let me make sure I, I, I echo those sentiments. Sex in the mail. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it's, it, gosh, you know, we have probably beat to death the word pivot, but mm -hmm. it's just the word that continues to pop up. Um, Personally, you know, certainly as a, as a, a father, and I, I always lead that a, as a husband, it's been about making sure that the family is safe. But um, there have been moments of where you're totally helpless because you, you feel that you take care of, of having all the precautions, the protections, and yet there are many of those around us, uh, friends and family and, and, and others, if you will, that are still um, at risk or being harmed by the, uh, the virus. But at the same time, it's just it's, it's this battle with this newness, this this freshness, this new identity in terms of, of, of BLM and, and mm -hmm. how it's almost like that hashtag Me Too. And it's kind of this wave that despite um, so many barriers and obstacles, we continue to have, have that Maya Angelou, you know, still I rise. And it's just it's not even logical in terms that we you know wake up the next day and you come outside and you know the new norm you get up you you do your thing you you have breakfast you have your coffee and you put your mask on right and you get in the car and you drive in because like, we're here at, at missouri state i'm actually in my office although it's limited mm -hmm. um i would say you know as far as organizations whether it's a university or a nas you know we've moved to virtual um the, the beginning at the, the end of, of the last school year you know many events were virtual and they were difficult and a lot of uh faculty and students and friends um, and even uh, supporters were not very happy about it, but we made it through. Um, we just completed a virtual NAS last week and it, and it was uncomfortable for, for many, but they made it through. And, and ultimately that is what I have um, come to see that folks are really in, into your question about how they're getting through is they're figuring out ways to pivot, reinvent and continue to, to offer and engage uh, to the best of their ability and um, we're just going to continue to push on. Mm. Dr. Lavoie, coming coming to to you, you're at the the Tucker Center for Research, and and there's so much. So I was overwhelmed when I clicked on the website and 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 read through much of the work that that is being done and continues to be done. How has COVID impacted your work and the center's work and and trying to move such important work forward? Mm. Yeah. Um... Thank you, Dr. Fletcher, and um, thank you for having me here this morning, and it's a real pleasure to share the screen with my colleagues. Um, I really am privileged to say that COVID has not impacted the work of the Tucker Center all that much. We were able, much like Dr. Hart, to pivot virtually quite quickly and easily. I mean, I say that with <laughs> a little uh, cliche, but We've been able to do some of our best work, and that I, I don't say that lightly, um, recently, because it's really made me pause and reflect and think about what have we been doing well and what could we do better and how could we do it more efficiently? Because it, I don't know about you, but everything I do takes about three times longer in a virtual environment. So it mm -hmm. feels like while everything slowed down, I actually have more to do, which I, I, this paradox is, I'm still trying to wrap my head around it. But um, I think what it's allowed the Tucker Center to do is we've continued our education, our research, our outreach. But in terms of our outreach, we've had to put that on pause 
And that pause has really helped allow me to think about a new strategic plan. How do I keep the Tucker Center remaining relevant and cutting edge in a really dynamic changing landscape of sport? Um, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the inequities uh, and inequalities around girls and women in sport have only been exacerbated by COVID around the world. So I think it's made the, the, the position of the Tucker Center even more relevant than ever before. And it, COVID has helped me bring the Tucker Center to new audiences that are seeking out the information on our website um, because it's, it's, a, it's an issue that is being highlighted by COVID and people are seeking uh, research and information on it. So I think we're in a really good position I, I appreciate that. And I appreciate you pivoting a bit to some of the opportunities that, that COVID ha has, has brought. And, and I'll continue to spotlight that as well, because again, understanding, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, understanding that some who are here on, on watching us um, aren't necessarily in the similar positions of resources and tools. So they are looking for different nuggets and opportunities that are practical to do this, this demystifying of pivot, as, as we talk about, what does pivot really mean? Uh, Dr. Dr. Hilton, I, I'll, I'll come to, to you next to, to get your thoughts on how COVID has impacted you. And I'll continue to remind everyone that you're in the UK because you have such a thick American accent. I feel like I need to, to make sure I remind everyone. Dr. Hilton, yes. your, your thoughts. Thank you, Sean. Yes, it is. What I, what I have got is a very northern flat vowled accent. That's what I have. Um, you learned something new. Today. But, I, but I, I, I am a, I am a, you know, I was born in London and, uh, you know, I, I do count myself as a, as a, co as a Cockney, but an adopted northerner. But anyway, mm -hmm. um, I, so COVID has, has affected me in a couple of ways. Um, so one, as, as a, an activist, scholar as, as, I, as I see myself and, and others, others around me on the panel. Um, my, my, my inbox has been busy, as you can imagine, with requests to uh, get involved with um, projects around you know, Black Lives Matter, um, uh, the, the COVID context. In fact, I did a, an, an annual race lecture only last week around the age of COVID. This is, this is a term that's being used, used uh, quite, quite commonly now. And so, and, and so this, this notion of, of, of pivoting isn't, it hasn't been, you know, as, as, as Nick, Nicole was saying, it's not been a, a major issue for me because what, I'm, what I found myself able to do is to, is to incorporate as we as we do uh, with 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 half decent writing. Um, we incorporate the current context into our work, and we try, especially as critical sociologists, we try to um, retain the currency of what we're saying with what's actually happening. What's actually happening today? So, I've found that I've uh, I've occasionally been saying. We've, we've seen this before. It might not have been called um, a, a, a global pandemic. It might not have been called Black Lives Matters, but we've seen these spikes of, of, uh, of protest, of racism, um, and we have seen the, the, the intro to them, the lead into them, and we've also seen the conclusion of them. Uh, so that the spikes are spikes for reason because they come and then they go. Um, so, so as a as a as an indiv individual, I found that there are clearly consistencies, uh, the continuities, and contradictions with all of these spikes that that we've seen over over time. But as uh, as you can see me, behind me, as chair of the the Sheffield Race Equality Commission, again mm -hmm. Sheffield is in the north of England. Mm -hmm. It's uh, a, l a little smaller than Leeds and Manchester, uh, but still quite a diverse, uh, diverse, uh, diverse city region. 
Now, due to a number of things coming together, and uh, was it uh, Algerian who talked to, talked about um, this idea of pivot being a, a common uh, a common term? Well, another common term is confluence. Mm. You know, the, mm-hmm. this, this this notion of um, the the public health health matters coming together with the Black Lives uh, Matter coming to uh, coming together, George Floyd, and so on. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there, uh, yeah, and the decolonizing decolonization um, project that's 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 uh, that's international. A number of things have come together in the Sheffield region, including its own historical connection with race and racism, to to lead to the uh, the instigation of this commission, uh, of which one of the, the the six threads is sport and culture so so for me as the as the chair you know clearly a number a number of things have come together for the race equality commission to be established that's a great lead in to to a couple of topics we'll talk about here shortly rochelle you're you're at laureus sport for good uh, yet another website that overwhelmed me with the work that you're doing globally even uh talk a little bit about how how COVID has impacted your work and the work of Laureus and the foundation and, and some of the great work that we'll learn more about throughout today's session. But talk a little bit about the impact from your side. Definitely. Well, first of all, I just have to say thank you um, to San Jose State University and Dr. Akila for allowing me to be part of this panel of people who are way more qualified than me. So I'm um, excited to be here and be part of this. But um, yeah, I think just to give a little context for Laureus, because we are unique in the sense of, you know, we're not an academic institution, we're a nonprofit organization, um, but we're actually an intermediary. So we fund organizations that are using sport as a tool for social change. Um, so this pandemic completely shifted all the work that we were doing, the work that was being done on the ground, just for the simple fact that people were no longer able to attend these programs in person. Um, but I think what's so important for people who um, aren't as familiar with the youth sports space, or in particular, the sports based youth development space, mm-hmm. is to just highlight that it only had these organizations kick into overdrive. Um, these organizations began to work harder than ever to serve the communities that have been disproportionately affected by this pandemic and by racial justice since the beginning of time um, and to serve them during this time in different ways. So they were doing virtual meetings, they were providing them with meals, they were helping with the tutoring. And so while sport wasn't happening in the traditional sense, the power of sport and from what we saw was was stronger than ever. Um, It's interesting what Dr. Lavoy said about being busier than ever. I, I think that's how Laureus felt, that's how so many of the organizations that we work with felt. Um, And it definitely affected our work, you know, it affected um, funding streams. A lot of the partners that we work with in these times didn't feel as comfortable in multi-year partnerships, right? Whereas before they might say, we're going to commit to three years of funding. Now they're saying, I don't know what tomorrow is going to look like, let alone 2021. So can we do, you know, one year of funding? So it in turn had us think through how can we best support the organizations on the ground. And what we found was that, you know, these organizations needed things right away. And so whereas before we put out funding opportunities kind of systematically um, in certain geographies based on funding that we receive, we were able to pivot and provide immediate relief funding for all of the over 50 organizations that we support across the country. Um, and say to them, you know, here's what we can provide to you right now. Use it however you see best fit. I think what's so important in this time is to lean into organizations that you trust into existing organizations that you know are doing amazing work. And so it's not telling them how they should do it or how they should change or what needs to be done, but it's saying we know that you know the best way to serve these kids right now and to serve their families. So here's what we can provide to you and here's how you can, and here's how we can support you during this time. Um, so I think in a way it did almost draw us closer to our mission. You know, I, I am proud to say, I think we are a very mission driven organization. Um, we work to improve the lives of youth and unite communities through the power of sport mm-hmm. and the pandemic just made us draw even closer to that. If, if it wasn't directly going to, help us achieve that mission. We just didn't have time or resources to make it happen. Um, So I think in some ways, you know, there was that silver lining of not only us 
getting even closer to our mission, but also just of each of us understanding why it's so important, why the work that we do is so critical and so crucial. And, you know, unfortunately it was exacerbated during this time, but it's always been important. And so how can we continue to ensure that we're providing the support to the groups that are doing this amazing work all across the country. And, um, you know, shout out to Dr. Hilton. We're based in London. Um, so it was also really great actually to be able to work with our colleagues globally. So I think, you know, before this, we were maybe a bit more siloed in the way that we worked as national foundations because we're each separate 501c3s, you know, operating in different ways. But this was a global pandemic. And so we came together and we actually formed a global sport for good response fund. And we're able to say, you know, organizations need the support around the world. What programs can we support? What organizations can help us support these programs? And how can we actually share resources within the Laureus Network to make sure that we're having even further impacts than what we would have individually. I appreciate that. And, and again, uh, perfect segues to, to many of the, the discussions that we'll continue to have. And, and Rochelle, I, I predict some inquiries in your inbox soon because you mentioned two things, sport and funding. So there are a number of folks I believe will be interested in following up with you and our other panelists uh, following this. But uh, let's let's shift a, a bit, as as Dr. Hilton mentioned, confluence, as if COVID wasn't enough. Uh, and, and Dr. Lavoie, I'm coming to you first. As if COVID wasn't enough, um, particularly again, we 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 know as being sort of uh, entrenched in this social justice, social inequity work, having the sensitivities to see it all. We knew it didn't start on May 25th with George Floyd. We knew. But, but it seems as though the world found out that there was social and racial inequity when George Floyd was so, so uh, publicly killed. How did that impact your work? The work that each of you all do has in some shape, form or, or, some, some shape, form or fashion, social justice, social equity at the heart of it when the, the social change movement started to happen, particularly in the wake of George Floyd's death, how did that impact? Did you feel a need to shift that, here goes that word again, pivot your work? And, and, and did you see any maybe challenges in trying to align your work with the, the, the racial equity movements that started to ensue? Dr. Dr. Lavoie. Yeah, well, I think George Floyd's murder, which happened in our backyard, uh, I think made the all of us in Minnesota, as well as around the world who were watching this, but particularly because it was really close to home for us. The Tucker team talked at great length about this. Um, it happened during the summer where I was mentoring five interns the next gen of scholars and advocates for girls and women in sport. And, and these um, young people were um, very, very much impacted by this. The, the riots and the, the protests that were happening were happening in our neighborhoods. And so, you know, we talked a lot as a group about what does this mean to our work? I think the work of the Tucker Center We've always been about gender equity, which in itself is about social justice. So I don't think it affected what we were doing. I think what I thought a lot about as the director is, should I have a message about this? Do I need to come out with a statement? Do I need to make it explicit that the Tucker team stands in support? There are a lot of organizations making performative statements about this that seemed, it sort of rang inauthentic to me in a way. And I didn't want the Tucker Center to jump on the bandwagon and make a statement just because everybody thinks we should. I wanted our work to stand for itself. I think if you know anything about the Tucker Center, it would be obvious that we would be stand in support of, of George Floyd. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't so much a pivot, but I wanted our us to be more intentional and keep the focus on our work and do it well and better, but also at the same time, amplify the voices of underserved girls and women. 
to use our platform, whether it's social media, our website, and the work that we do for the greater good. I sort of took my lead from the WNBA this summer as I watched what these amazing women were doing and using their platform to advocate for social justice and racial equity. And so we did use our fall distinguished lecture series to focus our scholarly work around five black women scholars who focus their, their work on athlete activism, one being Dr. Akila. Um, and so it wasn't so much as a pivot, but I wanted to be intentional and aware and, and make sure that we were doing the right thing for the right reason, I guess, is a, the best way to sum it up. I, we were already uh, planning to expand our research on women in sport leadership to be more intentional, intentional about raising the voices and experiences of women coaches of color. Um, and we were already in the uh, moving towards partnering with We Coach, not the We Coach Megan Bartlett that you heard from yesterday, the other We Coach, <laughs> um, to partner with them on their We Amplify initiative for women coaches of color. So we already had some things in the works and then this happened. And I guess I was fearful that people would see that as, oh, well, you know, the Tucker Center, you're just bandwagoning and want to yeah. do this because it's the right thing to do at the right moment. But um, I, I'll just let our work stand for serving underserved girls and women. And then we want to just be more intentional about that moving forward. Mm -hmm. And not to co-opt it, you know, I want, the vo I want to partner and collaborate with the women that are underserved and use their voices to help us move our research, education, and outward, outreach forward. I, I appreciate that. And, and, and I particularly appreciate the sensitivity to not putting out knee-jerk performative messages. A lot of the work that I do, we're partnering with different organizations, that was one of the, the cautionary notes that I would give them is let's take a step back and, and process this because you can, you can sniff out a, a hollow, inauthentic message a mile away. We all can. So I, I appreciate that. And, and as you moved forward with the mandate, the chief mandate of the Tucker Center, I appreciate you bringing that to the forefront. So many of those who are watching can understand that again, you wrestle with, and we all wrestle with, many of the different nuances before you you send a message out or before you shift work or before you amplify work yeah. even Do dr hilton you yeah. being in the in the, the the uk many feel as though george floyd was an american issue and it, it it sparked american problems and it gave light to american ills yes speak speak to how george floyd and the ensuing uh, um, racial justice movements that we're still in, quite honestly, let's not diverge, we're still in it. How did that impact where you are, your organization, the work you're trying to do? Well, okay, well, first, first I'd like to just add to, to what's been said already yeah. um, about really how, how, we've, how we've pivoted or not. Uh, at, at this time, because for me, I have always written um, about the everydayness of racisms. So the everydayness of racisms, um, and the and this is something I said to to Akila the last time I I, I did a, a panel with her only a few weeks ago, that the, the race racism is um, pedestrian and not spectacular. You know, it's that the it's that Gloria Ladson Billings reference. Okay, so on that basis, when I have talked about and tried to enlighten um, folks about the everydayness of, of racism and, this, and the significance of, of race in society, I've drawn on um, everyday cultural products, like, uh, cultural activities like cycling, like running, like playing, like uh, swimming. These are things that we have heard, even over the past year, that people have done, and whilst doing them, especially in the, in the States, 
have been racially profiled and their experience of their sport, their experience of their own discretionary leisure time is discernibly different as a result of their ethnicity, their biography. Mm-hmm. So, so, so these are things for me, if you, um, if you have a sense of how race and racism plays out in the everyday, then mm-hmm. these things that we've, these, these spectacular things that we have seen in recent times will be, be seen as, yes, a spike, but things that happen every day in different ways to different people at, at different levels, if you, if you can imagine that. Mm-hmm. Now, in, in, the, in, everyday con- in the UK context, many, many see this time as an opportunity to get diversity and inclusion back on the agenda, as you were saying, Mm-hmm. inauthentic inauthentic statements and um and uh and poly and policy documents um and so but there are clear tensions around the level and quality of these these endorsements as, as far as i can see and actions not just across the sports sector but across a number of sectors um so for for me as a, a practitioner in, a, in another life in, in community mm-hmm. sport development, academic and critical friend to, to policy makers. Currently, it's clear to me that this heightened awareness of injustice in the UK, you, you asked me about the UK mm-hmm. um, context, injustice to race and it's old wine in new bottles. Mm-hmm. That, you were talking about a knee jerk. There's that reaction. There's that, oh, woe is me. This should never happen. You know, mm-hmm. right across sport and across sectors um but what happens next is the problem um and we see this in the in the uk not just because of what's happening now in this in this moment that we're that we're in but we've seen it previous we've seen it previously Mm -hmm. so if you know as uh, you know as bob marley says if you know your history then you will know where you're coming from right Mm -hmm. so if you understand these cycles, you will see these patterns have already played out previously. So you'll know uh, know where they where they're going. So so for me, what a sustainable approach must must do is operate operate outside of these spikes. Do mm-hmm. the equalities work when mm-hmm. no one is watching? Okay. Mm-hmm. And as I, as I as I started off by saying, in our everyday business, that's when. We should be focusing on our our statements, our policies, our strategies, uh, uh, imp- and implementing them. Not when we we've heard terrible news, but because we think it's right to do it in our everyday business. So, mm-hmm. in in the UK context, in the UK context, there's been a lot of reflection on on what happened in the in the US and responses to to uh, George Floyd Black Lives Matters the decolonizing um, um, global protest um, uh, however what we what we have mm-hmm. are fragmented approaches some mm-hmm. good and others predictably uh, uh, superficial Mm-hmm. And some of these, these some of these stands are being made without irony, without contrition um, around what what um, has happened in the past. They are, you know, they are responses by those in, in a way uh, who have perpetuated these racialized inequalities, and now somehow they have the expertise to move. Somebody talked about the dial, but to, I think it was yeah. it, it was Rachel. Move the dial forwards, mm-hmm. and for me, there has to be a recognition in the UK, the US, wherever that other voices need to be part of this conversation, part of their conversation about how to move the dial forwards. So yes, the the eyes for all sorts of reasons, even this week, mm-hmm. have been on the US, mm-hmm. and and we've been uh, holding our our breath in the hope that there is a, a changing of the guard. Um, but Trump, as, Trump aside, uh, what's been happening in the, in the US has changed the world this year. Um, um, and we have, as I said before, seen some continuities and some, some inconsistencies. Mm-hmm. I, I appreciate that. And, and it, it's, 
It's particularly important, especially for us here stateside, to not get siloed into thinking that the challenges that we are seeing being brought to the forefront are unique to, to us. And you've written a number of different uh, uh, publications around racism and sport and shaming the color lines and, and things of that nature that I invite those to, to go in and, and take a look at. And we'll talk a bit more about that later, but I appreciate you bringing uh, the, the outside of our boundaries perspective to open up perhaps our paradigm uh, uh, of how we're viewing these issues that we're facing every single day. Ro Ro Rochelle and, and, and Dr. Hart, I'm, gonna, I'm coming to, to you because I can talk about this for hours with you all and we don't have that, I've been told. So from the, the standpoint, and feel free to pivot back to, to what I just asked Dr. Hilton and Dr. Lavoie if, if you choose to, but we've talked about how COVID has impacted us organizationally, how social injustice has impacted your work. We're on a sport panel. Let's bring it back to, to sport a, a little bit and talk about those intersections and identify those intersections. Ro Rochelle, with, with Loria Sport for Good, and again, I, I encourage those who are watching to, to take a look at some of these references I'm dropping because they're important. I learned something as I was doing a bit of, of research on it. I read that Nelson Mandela speech at the Laureus World Sports Awards in 2000 inspired the foundation in general, the Laureus Sport Foundation in general. And there was a particularly powerful quote. I, I love, love Nelson Mandela and I love to, to read up uh, on many of the inspiring world changing commentary he gave, particularly he said about sport. He said, sport has the power to change the world. It has the power to unite people in a way that little else does. He said, sport can awaken hope where there was previously only despair. This is a larger question that I'm going to ask everyone, but I think it's important for us to try and answer this age-old question. What role does sport have in moving a society forward with regard to social justice and equity? Particularly, do we expect too much? from sport. Rochelle, I'm starting with you and, and Dr. Hart, I'll come to you next. No, it's a, it's a great question. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that quote was literally what inspired the founding of the mm -hmm. Laureate And so when you talked about, you know, did we have to pivot? Did we have to, you know, Laureus was founded 20 years ago as a direct belief in sports ability to tackle racism. Mm -hmm. um, so I think this has just helped us re-highlight on the way we do that. And if we're mm -hmm. doing it, well, can we do it better? Um, and so I, I think, um, I'll say it depends on who you ask, right? If you expect too much of sport, I'll say for Laureus, um, we specifically are in the business of, of using sport intentionally to drive outcomes. So I think sometimes um, people might expect too much of like sport for sport's sake or professional sport or competitive sport. Um, I don't think we expect too much of sports-based youth development because we see the results day after day after day. And, um, you know, is it that SBYD is going to eventually end systemic racism? Mm -hmm. Maybe not. Maybe it will, though. Just say that. Um, but what it, what it does do is it changes individual lives every single day. So we're, we're literally seeing that even in this time, um, that the organizations that are providing opportunities to Black and Brown children of color in these communities are mm -hmm. going on to succeed. And that in itself is a form of fighting racism, right? Providing opportunities mm -hmm. in these communities that otherwise wouldn't have them. And I think sometimes parents expect sport is going to give their kid a scholarship. It's going to make the kid be the next LeBron James, the next Kevin. Mm -hmm. Maybe, you know, statistically that's not the case mm -hmm. most likely, but what it is going to do is it's going to provide your kids with the life skills to succeed in whatever way they want to succeed whether that is going to college, whether that is getting a job, whether that is being a father, a mother, a brother, a sister, a citizen in society. And so I think what the sport world should do is focus in on, am I using sport intentionally at every level, right? We do it at the grassroots level. And so we only fund organizations that are using sport to drive outcomes. But there are so many, you know, this pandemic has actually shown a light on the similarities between for-profit and non-for-profit sport. Yeah. And a kid at any level needs to understand some basic principles around equality, around kindness, around respect, around justice. And at whatever level you're on, are you getting those values through sport? And if you're mm. a 
are you teaching those values through sport? And if you're an organization, are you living by those values? And so whether you're at the professional level, at the for-profit, at the non-for-profit level, how are you letting the beautiful uniting power of sport make a difference in the work that you are doing? And so I think that's what we try to focus on. And I think what's been so great, um, you know, I don't want to say, but you know, what's been a, actually a, a silver lining in this is yeah. we've actually got to lift up the voices of those people doing the work in the community. So often people come to us to say, you know, um, talk to us about, you know, racial justice in sport and this, and, and even our funders, right? We had a partnership that came out of, you know, they wanted to do something because they saw this all happening. They were a corporate. They said, how can we respond to that? And I think, you know, there's, you got to kind of be careful with how you do that. But what we said is actually, let's set up a call with five organizations that are working in the west side of Atlanta and the south side of Chicago in the inner cities of Los Angeles. And let's hear from them directly about what they're dealing with and how you can support them. Because that's what is that's what matters right now. And that's where you should be learning from. And I think there's a role to be played at every level, but it's it's been so um, good to see more and more of the grassroots voices that we've been able mm -hmm. to up who have been doing this work for years and are, this is nothing new this is they knew this stuff has been happening they've been making an impact and making change in this space and mm -hmm. it's lifting those voices and those stories to ensure that um, at whatever level a person is trying to make an impact in sport they see how it can be done correctly mm. I, I appreciate you giving light to the different levels where where sport is impactful in shaping and molding exactly how we move forward and, and even some of the, the the more obscure entry points to make impactful change is important. Do Dr. Hart, your, your your thoughts on the role of sport in our in moving a society forward. We've heard, and again you see the gray hairs, so I can I can go back to when our athletes have said that I'm just an athlete. That that's what I want to do. This is way before the shut up and dribble movement that sparked activism. We had athlete, many athletes on the professional and collegiate level who just said, hey, listen, I'm paid to play ball. That's not what I do. What role does sport play in moving our society forward, dealing with the social ills that we see? Uh, well, first of all, for someone that said they shouldn't be on the panel, she sure was spitting fire. That's all I'm going to say right there, Rochelle. Either, either. Very yes. well said. <laughs> um, yes. You're taking notes, right? Um, you know, it, it's this this ongoing rebirth of consciousness, right? It's, mm -hmm. it, it's not a newness, but it's getting back to it. And mm -hmm. so it's this conversation that, that, that it's, you know, it's, it's the choice. Like you've got the Frederick Douglass and then you've got the W.B. Du Bois, right? You, you, you've got this, this, these notions of, of kind of that, that Nat Turner. We, we're going out and we're taking heads, mm -hmm. right? And, and what I mean by that is the choice. So we look at NBA players. And so, you know, it reminds me, and, and I, I want to kind of look at it because what we'll hear more is the Ali and the Kaepernick, right? And, and those decisions and those choices and then eventually Kaepernick over time, because you said you gave that historical framework, will be uh, in that same conversation with that same love. But we forget the vitriol that Ali experienced prior to him being the most beloved athlete ever. So from a historical framework, it's about this right here and right now. Um, I use the term pivot, but I think another word we could use is, is process. I think many of us are still processing it in terms of what sport is doing. I've always said from the ag academic educational side and, and a lot of folks you know, push back, but the reality is athletics on, on so many campuses is the front porch. It, it, it's your view into the, the institution. And so mm -hmm. as we see these things cultivated, ultimately we begin to think in terms of sport. And so we use words like riot and on the other end somebody will say civil unrest someone else will say civil disobedience and somebody else will say advocacy and allyship mm -hmm. and what that means and so we use sport as a platform because we're so thirsty because we're in the middle of a pandemic for some normalcy we just want to see baseball season we just want to see football oh forget they're testing positive that's okay those young student athletes they can deal with it we have cancellation of winter sports why do we want to do that we have parents 
showing up while their sons and daughters are on campus talking about, we need to have football. We need to have these things. It is such an urgency mixed in with a sense of entitlement that totally is devoid of looking at a pandemic. So I go to this, there's so much noise going on. And I mm. think it's about, you know, what, what and I, I wrote this down with um, Nicole had stated in terms that it was so eloquent about, you know, she wanted to plan, right? It wasn't just about jumping on what everybody else was doing. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what we found out about sport, that in it actually was about trying to figure out what is going to be the best plan for us to put out a message and how that's ultimately going to impact the broader society. And that is where things stand right now, as far as I'm concerned, to these approaches of those that have needed advocacy, as Kevin was talking about, though those that have been invisible and, and that inbox filling up and saying, hey, you know what, uh, uh, Kevin can be a spokesperson for us. And and mm-hmm. Rochelle talking about, you know, the organization going on, you know, we need to feed people. We need to make sure people are all right. And mm-hmm. we have this platform to engage them. And so now we're talking about community building. And so we're getting back to looking at, wait a minute, we don't need to build community. We are the damn community. We need to figure out how we can better serve one another and not fall prey to just all the noise. So I go back and I see sport as really that that um, glue, if you will, for individuals to rely upon. And and if if nothing more than to just take a pause and to kind of remember, wow, how, how sport has really pushed us in so many ways. So rather that's Ann Myers or that's Skylar Diggins. If you're the first mm-hmm. on one end or you're somebody that benefited on the other end, we're mm-hmm. still moving forward. And, and, and that is where I believe sport allows for us to to fuel and to move forward. Mm. Dr. Lavoie, your name was invoked. So I'm gonna come to, to, to you next uh, since we're coming out of political season. I just wanted to say that. So again, same question to, to you. And, and again, the, the work that you do is, is, is so profound and so impactful. It's so organized from the standpoint of how how sport plays a significant role moving us forward, moving a society forward. Can you speak to, to even the role of, of leaders and organizations even as you give sort of your commentary in general? Yeah, and I um, thank you, Dr. Hart, for calling me eloquent. Um, your check <laughs> is in the mail. <laughs> um, I would like to make a friendly amendment to Nelson Mandela's statement. Uh, Maybe that's taking a little bit too much liberty, but I think if I can say sport can awaken hope and sport can also awaken despair. Mm. It's both and. And the good work that Rochelle and Lorius does, that's the hope. But the work that I do in terms of organizational and systems change and convincing leaders in positions of power to take seriously efforts of gender equity and Mm -hmm. racial equity. Oftentimes I'm asked, Dr. Lavoie, how do you stay so positive when all this data is very disheartening? Um, My, it is. And if we didn't do it, we would be in much worse state than we are. So my position in the Tucker Center is how do we do research to get the data that helps us do education to change systems Mm -hmm. that will make a difference for girls and women in sport. And what's good for girls and women is good for everybody. So, you know, our focus is about gender, but what's good for girls and women is good for society. So, Mm I just think that in terms of, I I think we're at a moment where we can use this leverage point of Black Lives Matter, the confluence of of racial inequities and public health concerns with COVID to really hold leaders who have made these performative statements of allyship, to hold their feet to the fire to say, 
you stood up and you said you were for this. So what are you doing? And this is to holding, and I'm, I, I will say this because we know this from the data, it's mostly men, white men in positions of power in sport organizations that need to take seriously a, their own racial and gender bias that is creating a culture and an organizational system that is not serving everybody. And that is where we really need to see the target of opportunity for social change is the leaders in charge of sport need to be better. And that's a call to action right there. Words to action, which is this conference and the Institute's um, tagline, words to action. Let's not just say, let's do. And that has to do with white men in positions of power in sport around the globe. Be better. Very yeah. strong statement. Make I, I, a, a go ahead, Rochelle. point on that, because I'm just going to say that's such a great point, because to that point, if the world was being run by these grassroots SBYD organization leaders, it wouldn't be what it is today. So yes, like it's so important that the people that are in the highest level of power make the changes at that level so that those at the bottom can rise to the top and can be heard and we can move forward at a completely whole level. And so I agree changes are being made and it's better than it was, but um, you know, it would be in a way better place if they were doing those things that Dr. Lavoie mentioned. So I think that's a great point. Mm, sounds like we need to get our get a third party on the ticket. It sounds a, a sport and society uh, party. How, how about how about we introduce that to, to the political spectrum? Doctor Doctor Hilton, your your thoughts. Thank you. I I would. I generally do not have the uh, the temerity to uh, correct Nelson Mandela. <laughs> so Nicole was very brave in that in that sense. Though I I think that his his quote. Um, I think his quote keeps us keeps us warm, and it's and it, and it's uh, it's super idealistic, and it's important that our inner child remains remains there, and that our our aspirations remain as they are. Um, now, I I I I honestly believe that when I look at that quote, I'm looking at that quote through rose tinted glasses. Um, because I'm very, very pragmatic and, and very much a realist. And the thing is, I love sport, but I also know that sport can bring us our, our highest highs and our lowest lows. Mm -hmm. uh, sport can, can show us the worst excesses of the human condition. And what we need to remember, what we need to remember is that Sport in itself can't do anything. It's people that need to establish, establish the suffi sufficient conditions mm -hmm. for things to happen. So, uh, so what are those sufficient conditions that will enable activism to, to take place, anti-racism to take place, for critical reflexivity within organizations, for act, for, um, uh, um, key performance indicators to be written and to be measured and evaluated. Um, we know that people can play sport in the same place but be absolutely disconnected. Um, so that, that sense of integration, um, that sense of inclusion is, mm. is again, uh, up, um, kind of more, more aspirational than, than um, natural. So that so so for me and I I've, Rachel I I have actually spoken at a laureus event at the House of Commons in London um, with with Derek Bardowell who who yeah who worked with you guys and so I, I absolutely support the, the the work of laureus at the same time I am I am critical of of what sport can what what sport has the potential to do. Um, and, and what it what it what we what it needs help with, and and we you know we are the people that that have to establish those those conditions, work with policymakers, practitioners, academics, so that they can actually use sports for good as you're as you're doing. 
Mm -hmm. I, I appreciate it. And, and Dr. Hilton, I'm, I, I want to follow up j just a bit because it, it ties in so well uh, even to, to Dr. Lavoie's somewhat amendment to Nelson Mandela's statement, which was very tactfully done. So I, I appreciate the way you did that, Dr. Lavoie. But to that point, Dr. Hilton, you wrote a book, Contesting Race and Sport, Shaming the Color Line. And you specifically discuss how sport can perpetuate racism and how language can be used as a device for resistance against racism in sport. So much yeah. to the point of what Dr. Lavoie was, was mentioning that it can also exacerbate despair as well. Yes. Now, while you wrote that book a couple, a couple of years ago, yeah. how might it be particularly relevant in 2020 with what's going on right now? Well, I, I, I expect when this, when this uh, video goes, goes live, and viral, of course. Of course. Um, the the webinar will will shock will shock some people because they will um, be holding uh, close to their heart the, the the idea that sport is race neutral, uh, mm -hmm. that it's married to uh, it's a meritocratic space, mm -hmm. um, and and what I do in in my my book is I problematize those those ideas, um, and and quite frankly, most of my work before and since. Uh, does that that sort of thing not just within sport but across disciplines and in professions so I've already talked about my um, my engagement with the notion of everyday racism and, and that is something that I do, I was doing in 2018 I wish I could have said yes I was anticipating this rising peak of, of racism well actually no I, I wish I never said that but I think you know what I'm saying that, that I that I anticipated these these global shifts but of course what happened before 2018 enabled me to anticipate these sorts of things happening in 2019 and 2020 and 2021 so if you look at my work that I've I've done since 2018 and the work uh, to be published next this year and next year, there will be those consistencies in terms of how I approach everyday racism. So the colour-coded racism of past decades is still with us. But in, a, in, a, in addition to this, our critiques and activism require continued surveillance of institutional and structural arrangements. And I think this is what, what Nicole was, was, uh, was getting at um, earlier. Um, because these, you know, the issues that we have to, to disrupt around race and racism in these or in institutions and within society are mm -hmm. still nebulous, they're still complex and they're still very, very difficult to, to challenge. Um, now, one, intended, one unintended consequence um, of the recent elevation of the currency of race in the public, uh, public consciousness is how it, it's made less critical others see these problematics more explicitly mm -hmm. so and when i when i think about this i think of it the the the, the um uh it's almost like chris rock is saying it in my head so it makes me want to shout we told you so now mm -hmm. do you see it you know mm -hmm. you can imagine chris rock saying you know we so we've been talking about these issues for years and years and years and now suddenly less critical others are seeing what we have seen and we've been talking about for, for years on end. Um, also, I've regularly repeated Martin Luther King's quote uh, when he said, in the end, we'll remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends, right? Mm -hmm. uh, mainly because we still have those in the academy and in sport more, more broadly, who adopt these colorblind, race neutral, meritocratic frames. Um, that my my book and related work tries to disrupt. So today, a global pandemic, Black Lives Matter protest, may inform their approach to everyday issues. We know that people are thinking about these issues, but will they have the tools to comprehend what to do next? And mm -hmm. now it's clear to me that as activist scholars, we need to provide the necessary critical tools. That's, now that sounds a bit contrite, a bit arrogant. We need to help facilitate um, the, the, the necessary critical tools for people to be more reflexive. So in the words of Aud Audrey Lord, and, and this is always a good one to end at, um, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. So mm. 
you know i so that's so you know my so for for me um though i uh, my my uh, my my book and in fact my on the front of my book i have a i don't know if you've seen it um sorry this is like self pub publicity isn't it but on the front of it i have a picture of arthur ash mm -hmm. uh, shaking friends uh, shaking hands with with jimmy connors and and of course arthur ash said that his biggest burden um uh was racism now if you think uh that so the biggest burden in his life on his deathbed he he said the biggest burden of his life in uh, this is in his his autobiography um was racism now if you take arthur arthur ash and you, you can you can establish a continuity from arthur ash in the in the 70s through to coco goff in terms of their their experience of racism that that connectedness uh, um uh, from ash to serena williams serena williams wasn't around when ash ash was winning his uh, his slams mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. she will be taught she talks about how she is racialized uh, as uh, you know as a as a black woman and how she's viewed differently to say someone like maria sharipova who who really is is quite cold in comparison to to serena williams in terms mm -hmm. of her engagement with the with spectators in the press and then you have so and, and then you have um coco goff who was born five years after williams's um uh first grand uh, grand slam mm -hmm. i think she's about around 16 uh, I'm, I'm looking for nods actually around 16 and she is she is at the forefront of some of these uh black lives matter process this this kind of athlete activism now there are there are these consistencies which i try to uh, discuss in in my 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 book mm -hmm. because it makes it helps people to to take race more seriously in terms of its significance today in the past and it's likely um um uh, and it's and it's it's likely significance in the future and of course shaming the color line going back to what algerian said is came from w.e.b du bois who was talking about you know the the the, the 20th century you know the the color line being the biggest threat to the 20th century mm -hmm. he wasn't even thinking about the 21st and mm -hmm. we we're still to, we, so you know so you can make a link <laughs> he tries to do this make a link from me to w and us to w.e.b du bois in mm -hmm. terms of the way he was thinking about about society he wasn't talking about sport but we can as algerian uh say we can use sport as the front porch to engage these these other more structural issues Mm, I appreciate that. And, and, and just as a, a quick reminder, as we're going to we're going to shift in a minute towards open Q&A, uh, I invite those who are, are watching to submit your questions. We have a couple already, but we're going to ask a couple more questions before we move into our Q&A portion. So if those questions are coming through, go ahead and, and send them in uh, before we, we get started. And I'd be, I'd be remiss if I did not highlight that only in a words to action panel can we quote Mandela King, Audre Lorde, and Chris Rock all at the same time. You made me nervous for a second. It's a PG-13 broadcast. You made me nervous, but you, you pulled it off. Um, doc, Dr. Hart, and, and this is a question for, for everyone, but I, I'm gonna start with, with you. Um, I don't want to end the, the conversation without getting your thoughts and everyone's thoughts on mental health. Mental health is, again, still a, 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 a battle that's being waged. And we see it firsthand, not just with our student athletes, but we see them with leaders. We saw it before a global pandemic that completely interrupted societal and social norms. All right. All right. Your, from your perspective, has the conversation on mental health and sport evolved in a positive direction over the years? Is there more to be done? Are we talking about the right things? Are the stigmas being released? Are we, should we be doing more? What's your observation, Dr. Hart? Yeah, and Rochelle, to you next. We're, we're certainly behind the eight ball in regards mm -hmm. to the mental health um, we look at it from a, a sport lens, mental health, in terms of uh, framing it as how can I become a better athlete? How can I become more focused in, in, in that at, 
that side of the mental assistance mm. and that's not what we're talking about we're talking about the uplift of humanity and those involved um in and outside of sport um campuses because obviously in terms of, of working on a college campus and and in the mm. middle of a pandemic and you have individuals that are are not just food challenged but um technology challenged because they rather mm -hmm. they are off campus or they don't have the resources of uh, the gaps are significant and then you throw on top of it the mental health and um i was thinking about something that that kevin had said about dr king and and one of my favorite quotes that i always love to use is i cannot be what i ought to be until you are what you ought to be and so therefore in order for you to be what you need to be requires me to be involved and to care and, and to understand the, the intricacies of how you tick and vice versa. Mm -hmm. And so when we look at it through that, that question, the mental health is just about, it, it's the ignorance, just not knowing. It, it, it's not ignorance about somebody not having the intellectual capacity, but it's just not knowing. It's not knowing about the resources that are there to, to help individuals. It's not knowing about the, 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 the freedom to express and how that can can really sully an individual's day to day and where they can't even identify spaces of hope in the middle of an environment that already talks about hopelessness. So it's just being compiled and compounded on top of individuals. And so we get back to mental health and just us talking about it from a, a, a black perspective as a black male, like, what you mean mental health? I'm solid, I'm, I'm good, don't, don't worry about me. I, no, 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 I'm, I'm not good, I'm not okay. And being comfortable with acknowledging that is half the battle, but understanding that there are those that have an expertise, there are those that have compassion, or just those in spaces that will just simply listen is truly empowering. And so from that perspective and answering the question, we have a ways to go, but we're finding out that sport organisms and organizations are beginning to reach out to that community and bringing in those experts, which is certainly a huge step in the right direction. Hmm. I, I appreciate that. And, and Rochelle, uh, you bring such a unique add in to, to this collection of, of scholars on, on the panel, because the work that you do and, and Laureus does, it impacts the youth in a very real way. So on many, on, on many, from many standpoints, you're the entry point. You're at the ground level on a, on a global stage. Same question to you. Are, are we moving the needle with conversations around sport and mental health and from the youth standpoint, but in general, I want your, your thoughts. Yeah, this is such an important topic. Um, and I can say from the sport for development, sports space youth development, mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, even in, I've been in this space now for just about eight years. And even in that short amount of time, the way that how far we have come with organizations like we coach who are who have literally formed to provide these types of trainings with organizations now you knowing terms like social emotional learning with having their coaches being trained in trauma informed coaching um, this is something that is becoming so important to the groups we work with because they're working with youth that are in some of the most traumatic situations in the country. And so it's all, it's, it, it's irresponsible at so many levels, but it's especially irresponsible for the organizations we work with to not prioritize this and what they're doing. So there's so much farther that we have to come, but I am very encouraged by the early signs that I'm seeing with these organizations. Um, I mean, just to, to give you an example, um, we held an event um, a few weeks ago. We've been doing virtual training camps for the sector during this time. Um, th these are people that love to be around other people. They, they get their energy from that. And this has been extremely hard for this sector. And so we've been hosting these opportunities for like-minded individuals in sport for development to come together and to still provide them a way to invest in their craft when they often feel like some are unemployed, some aren't able to coach in the same way. And um, Dr. Lavoie, we did one actually specifically around training and, engage, and got around engaging girls during this time, specifically through sport, because we found that 
it's even more than boys, girls are dropping out even more now, right? And they're gonna be the ones that it's gonna be even harder to get back participating once this is all done. And we mm-hmm. had an individual from a group called Figure Skating in Harlem, which uses figure skating to um, train and mentor girls from the from the Harlem area in New York. She's mm-hmm. a 15 year old senior um, Hispanic individual. And when we asked her, you know, what can programs do to get girls interested in coming back and in participating? She said, offer them mental health services. She said, that's what in Harlem did and that's what made the difference as to why I wanted to go back and participate, right? It wasn't the sport itself, it was that piece of it. Um, so this this is so this is such a critical piece of what we do and what we advocate for. Um, if, if people are interested in a group who um, does uh, data around this really well, I recommend Hello Insights. Um, what's so great about them is we actually invested in them to create a tool that tracks social emotional learning and actually shows how sport is uniquely positioned to develop these skills in kids. And so it's able to say not just, you know, why SEL is so important because it can lead to the education, the employment, the, but it also says, this is how sport, when used intentionally, can specifically build those skills in youth. And so I just think, you know, at it's varying at different levels, but at the grassroots level, um, it's becoming more and more important. And it's something that groups are asking for more. So we do a lot of training and groups are saying, can you provide that? Because it's it's not, it's, it's expensive and it's as it should be, it's a really important skill. Um, and so I think the only caveat and kind of warning I'll say is um, being, you know, a black coach from a black community working with black kids doesn't make you an expert, right? Necessarily in how to deliver DEI or how to deliver trauma. So everyone at every level, regardless of what your experience has been, how much your lived experience has been, there are true experts in this space that you should invite in to teach you how you can coach better, how you can relate to your kids better. Um, held an event uh, two years ago in Los Angeles. And um, we like to think of ourselves as experts in SEL, right? Um, But we had a group of high school students and we had this beautiful experience where they got to meet kids from all across the country. Um, They got a chance to put together this summit to help develop their leadership skills. And we had a moment of reflection at the end and kids really began to open up about some of the past traumas they faced around um, sexual and gender identity, around racism, around these really intense issues. And afterwards, the staff, we were like, we needed to have mental health experts, psychologists, professionals in that room to deal with what these kids are speaking about. It's not enough that we care about them. That's, that, that's not necessarily going to solve that trauma. So it's ensuring that you have that balance and that um, you're really letting youth be set up in the best way to deal with what they've you know, been through in the past, but also succeed moving forward. Mm. And, and, and I appreciate that. And, and again, one of the reasons why your work is is so valuable to this conversation is there's oftentimes this this underlying conversation that there are generational differences in mental health in terms of we're dealing with unique and different challenges than you did, than our predecessors did. So even hearing that that's being spoken to and that's being addressed from a unique perspective of what current generations are dealing with is even is even an added uh, uh, area of importance. Do- Dr. Lavoie, sa- same question to you. Uh, with the work that you're doing, and in general, you as a, as a scholar, as a connoisseur of sports scholarship, around mental health, what are you? What are you seeing? Are we are we making progress when when Kevin Love and Demar Derozan and and those athletes come out and they speak on mental health and when when uh, Maya Moore and, and and some of the other athletes speak out about mental health, is that are we moving the needle or are you seeing that we still have significantly more work to do? Uh, it's both. I think we are moving the needle because we're now talking about it. We've brought it to light. I think that's so powerful when we have sporting role models saying, I'm struggling with this too. You know, I'm a great athlete, but I'm human. And I think um, the work that Laureus is doing on the ground with kids and, and building in social emotional learning and support for kids when they need it most, because now that a lot of kids can't play sport or it's being taken away, that's even exacerbating mental health problems because sport might have been the one context that helps them stay balanced or, or functional. Now, what I will say 
that sort of gets lost in this um, conversation is we often focus on athlete mental health, which is very important. And I'm not taking away from that, but we also need to focus on the mental health of coaches who are service providers and really healthcare workers in a lot of sense. And they are not trained as Rochelle was talking about this. They're not trained to deal with this. So we need more awareness of helping our coaches take care of themselves while they're taking care of kids. And we're seeing a little more talk about that, but not enough because coaching is about people, which can lead to a lot of emotional labor and great amount of burnout, especially right now. And we need and want those coaches to remain healthy mentally, emotionally, and physically. So I just want to add that as a, mm -hmm. a sidebar to this conversation is that coaches are people too. And we need coaches to be whole individuals so they can be the best for the kids and the young people that they coach. Got it. Dr. Hilton, your I, perspective. Yeah, I, I, I haven't done a great deal of work uh, on mental health. The closest that I have uh, really, uh, you know, talking about, about uh, coaches um, was around how how humor was used as a form of resistance yeah. to uh, to racism mm -hmm. um, in uh, as as a way of as a way of of sharing cultural wealth uh, as a way of sharing stories of of racism that mm -hmm. that had a had a, a, a underpinning moral so that that moral might be this is how you navigate this particular situation um this is how you disrupt um these these particular issues at these particular times so in 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 speaking to you know given i'm just thinking about terminology here mm -hmm. we, we would be talking about uh, black coaches or black asian and minority ethnic coaches mm -hmm. you would be talking about people of color but um uh uh, having having spoken to uh, uh, black coaches in the UK, mm -hmm. um, the response has been when they when they talk about experiences of racism. Because remember, when you when you when you share these quite these quite sensitive issues, you you make yourself vulnerable. Um, often, and please tell me if if this is the case with you. Often, those stories are told with a, a humorous content mm -hmm. uh, or context to them because there it takes some of the 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 stress and pressure of the of the receiver of, mm -hmm. of that of those messages now in in telling those those stories of of, of racism um they are at the same time um educating the other the individual or the group about particular context in particular organizations or particular spaces of a, of a city and how to then act they are then uh there is that so that sense of, of catharsis has some sort of impact on on mental health but for me that development of cultural wealth is is a way to help people um resist the everyday racism that they that they experience and they and and that resistance is coming from other people whose very act of sharing in safe spaces uh, enables this 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 opportunity to exhale mm -hmm. that, that opportunity to breathe and, and that catharsis so so for me when i think about it i think about um Po the positive mental health uh, consequences of of that of that sharing in those safe spaces. Mm, I appreciate that. And before I turn it uh, to, we have a few questions that that came in. I'd be remiss if I if I didn't give each of you an opportunity to somewhat give a a, a key takeaway to to the group. Those who are are listening in, and, and Dr. Hart, I, I'll start with you. Be, what is a is there a key message or key takeaway with, with everything that we've talked about and, and I can't believe it, it's been it's been an hour and and some change with everything that we've talked about 
Is there any key takeaway or key message that you want to make sure that the audience leaves here with? And then we'll turn it over to, to Q&A. Dr. Hart. Yeah, just two things. One, you need to make sure you're empowering somebody else. Mm. Two, if everybody in your circle looks just like you and believes in the exact same things that you do, you need to mm. expand your circle because you're not going to be able to empower anybody in that space because you're all just alike. Mm -hmm. So those are the two things for takeaways. Thank you. Dr. Lavoie. I would say that sometimes with the despair about there's so many issues to tackle and change in the system mm -hmm. that people often feel helpless. But my key takeaway for people listening is everybody can do something to help change the system. So find your passion and intersect with those that um, are doing that work and push the needle, right? I always say, um, if, you're a, if you're on a cruise ship and you want the cruise ship to turn 180, that's the system. It takes a lot of time and effort to get that cruise ship to go from north to south. But if you're a jet ski, you can pivot quickly. And if we have a lot of jet skis that are doing a lot of work and we're all pushing against the, the cruise ship, it will change faster. So be a jet ski. <laughs> well said. Rochelle. So, um, yeah, I think, I think two things. Um, I think the first one, just that, that sport is the tool for social change. So I think to so many other people's points, um, is the tool in the right hands? Is the tool working correctly? Is the tool being used intentionally? And if you are in the business or in the arena of sport, ensure that you are using that tool in a positive way to create that social change because the tool will not get the work done alone, but the tool can help build the bench, which can help sit the people sit, which can help you know the house. And so make sure you're using that tool intentionally. Um, I think the second thing is just, you know, youth voice is so important and so critical to this conversation around racial justice and around social justice. So if you are in that line of work and there isn't um, a youth voice in that circle, make sure you include them. And especially for the college students out there as young adults, um, you are so so critical to this movement and so be part of those groups be part of those movements um, and know that you know your opinion is valuable and the work that you're doing matters. Mm. Dr. Hilton. Regardless of the level um, you find yourself at mm. you should really be thinking about this the sort of action you get involved in so you need to ask yourself, are you, thinking, are you thinking about issues deeply and not acting because that's no good? Are you acting without thinking, the knee jerk that Sean was talking about early, earlier? That's no, that's no good. What you need is what Ledwith talk, talks about in her community development work. What you need is thoughtful action. So you move when you're ready I'd like to adapt the jet ski idea, but you move when you're ready, okay? Um, you move when you're ready and when you're in a position of strength. So that's the first thing, thoughtful action. The second thing is this, this whole idea of the, you know, I've got to change the world, I'm overwhelmed, I don't know where to start. It's, I remember hearing a long time ago that this very, notion of, and I'm pretty sure it was from the, the British sociologist, well, adopted British sociologist, he, um, uh, Carib he's from the Caribbean originally, Stuart Hall, um, a great, great cultural theorist, he talked about struggling where you are. Mm -hmm. So where you have a frame of reference, where you, you know, where you are able to influence things in your purview, that's where you struggle, okay, that's where you do your thing with the hope of then connecting with, with others who are doing the whole jet ski thing, lots of jet skis coming down. So you struggle where you are trying mm -hmm. to move that, that liner. Okay, so just those two things, thoughtful action and struggle where you are. 
Mm, I, I appreciate that. We have a few minutes left and we have a few questions that have come in. So it, it's perfect. I'm going to ask you uh, uh, targeted to each of you so we don't have time for everyone to chime in. So I'm going to target these questions. Dr. Lavoy, first question coming to you. And this is this is present, current, breaking news. The Miami Marlins yeah. today hired the first woman and Asian American general manager. In reference to more representation of women and minorities in sport leadership positions, can you speak to the significance of that? Well, I wish that I, um, we didn't have to speak to the significance, that mm -hmm. it wasn't the first and it wasn't breaking news. Uh, mm -hmm. I am going to be uh, excited for the day when this is not news. Um, but the fact that it is news is let's celebrate it. She's broken this, the uh, glass ceiling and there, uh, I, I was gonna put it up as my background, but there's a meme going around. Uh, women, put your, everybody and women put your shoes on because there's a glass ceiling shattering everywhere. And this is another example of that. So I think having a woman of color in a position of power in a major men's pro sport is very significant. Uh, people always ask me, well, does that mean the floodgate is gonna open? And I said, it's too soon to tell, mm -hmm. but where there's one, there's opportunity for more. And we've certainly seen that in the NBA where just a couple of years ago, we had one female in the NBA now we have 11, maybe more than that now. So it, it's, I think that's amazing. And congratulations to her. Absolutely. Rochelle, question coming in for, for you. It says, how do we and institutions specifically move away from the notion that sport is meant to provide entertainment and revenue rather than life skills and opportunity? And it was a callback to something they heard you mention a little bit earlier. Can you That's speak a to great that? question because just invest in Laureus and, and there you go. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Um, but no, I, I do think it's investing in the sports space, youth development, the sport for development sector. Um, so investing in organizations that are doing exactly that. And then those organizations that I think are on the for-profit side, investing in training coaches in those capacities. So kids need these skills at every level, regardless of where they fall on the socioeconomic um, or on the ethnic scale, they need these life skills to be successful. And so um, I think if you are in a place to invest, you should invest where the greatest need is. And so that, that is at the um, nonprofit, sports-based youth development, sport for development, grassroots level. But if you are already in the for-profit side of the business, ensure that you are in training your coaches in these life skills and you're letting your parents know why this is important. Um, mm -hmm. And I, you know, at the, at the professional level, partner with the groups in your community that are doing that work and tell their stories. So don't tell the story of, you know, the kid who made it to the championship and won the MVP, like that's great, but tell the story of the kid who joined this program and now they were able to graduate from high school and have gotten a job and moved back to their community and coached at that same program. Um, so highlight stories of people doing amazing work because of the skills they learned from sport versus just accomplishments they made in the sport itself. Hmm. Last, last question, and, and uh, I, this will be a, a somewhat of a, a split question for Dr. Hart and Dr. Hilton, because it certainly aligns with, with your work. Do, Dr., Dr. Hart, and, I, and I'll paraphrase a bit because it's a, a lengthier question. Um, given the privileged place of the academy, can you all say a bit more about how you envision the collaborations between researchers in the academy and organizations, perhaps like Rochelle's organization with Laureus, working closer to the grassroots level to advance the causes that we're all fighting for? So what I will say is the academy has spaces of privilege, but because we're all in it, we are not necessarily all privileged. So what I want to make sure that what I'm saying is that there are a multitude of voices that need to be heard. Now, the collaboration is what provides the strength. Um, the academy, is, it's the lens is certainly, I think that uh, Kevin discussed earlier about the rose-colored lens, right? It's, it's the perspective that you're coming from. But as I had said earlier when I was asked about um, a couple things to, to share with the audience, 
it's about collaboration, but you have to understand collaboration is going to have to come with sacrifice. It's going to have to be somebody else's voice is going to at certain times necessitate that they are out in front in order to move the, the, the pendulum so that we can engage with uh, Rochelle's of the world and, and the, the necessity of bringing her to a campus and not just bring her on campus, but actually taking the information she's discussing and implementing that into the curriculum so that students are being impacted. And therefore you're gonna have future conscious consumers of the product that we call sport and activism. So I, I just, I mean, we can, that's a, a tremendous question, but at the end of the day, it's the ability to have some kind of transferability and, and be willing to open up the doors because historically we don't do that and we're very poor at partnering unless it's something that ultimately advances our own agenda as an institution, when in turn, we need to be able to collaborate so it will impact consumers of our product. Mm, well said. Do Dr. Hilton, same, same question for you. The Academy, grassroots organization, how can you see potential synergies and alignment so we can move forward our shared goals and objectives for racial equity and inclusion from, from your perspective? I'm not sure if Dr. Hilton may have, have frozen. I think a bot got, got him. I'm not sure if he's frozen. I'm, I'm bummed that we're, we're not, not able to hear from, from Dr. Hilton on that. But um, fantastic questions. And there, there, was one other, there was one other question that was sent in uh, around models for mental health that I will, I'm not going to spoil the, the trivia question, but I'm gonna say there was a very well done segment uh, this summer during the summer speaking series that talked quite a bit about mental health from mental health experts who are doing the frontline work on it. So I'll refer that question asker to go back to that session. Again, I'm not gonna name it because that's a trivia question that Dr. Carter just mentioned. However, when you go back to the Words to Action website, you will see um, a few materials from that session that talks quite a bit about it. All right, so I'll refer you to, to that. But with that, with that being said, panelists, I, I appreciate you. Hopefully, uh, those who have been watching have drawn nuggets of wisdom, but also inspiration that you all are people who are on the front lines of the respective work that you do. And you are impacted just as everyone else with what is going on with society from a social, political, injustice, equity, inclusion, and all of the different levels from which we are and on which we're waging these battles. So from me to you, I appreciate you. Uh, I encourage you. I affirm the work that you all are doing. Please continue to do it. And I'm sure if our audience was live and could speak for themselves, um, they would echo that same sentiment. So thank you for imparting the wisdom. Thank you for the work that you and your organizations do. Please continue to do that work. Please, audience, follow up with, with these scholars and with these professionals on their social media feeds with the work that they are doing, because this is not just lip service. I can attest that this is actually pure motive work that they're doing. So with that being said, thank you so much. And, and Dr. Carter Francis, I will pass it over to you. Oh my goodness. What an amazing, amazing panel. Thank you, each and every one of you, Dr. Hart, Dr. Lavoy, Dr. Hilton, Rochelle Patel from Lawyer Sport for Good. Glad that you're here again to give that, that youth emphasis um, because again, they are our future. And the man with the mic, Doc Fletcher, I just have to give it up. Hands claps all the way around for conducting such a great panel. So with that said, um, we're gonna go to a, a little break. So you guys grab a coffee, grab something to eat, and we'll see you back here at 11 o'clock for our social change research presentations. Thank you. <laughs>